Hello, my friend, and welcome to the study, where today I am pleased to bring to you this relaxing video about Renaissance ocean navigation as part of the ASMR Renaissance Week, in which several very talented ASMR YouTubers have come together to publish videos about different aspects of the Renaissance. It is an honor for me to be included in such company, and I hope you will enjoy this video, and that you will have a look at the other videos in this project as they come out all week by using the playlist in the description below. The Renaissance spans several hundred years in Europe and is marked by certain styles of artwork, architecture, and philosophies, signaling a new perspective on classical ideas, thought, literature, and art, but also of science. Following the near collapse of society after the widespread bubonic plague almost decimated Europe's population, the Renaissance generally accepted as starting around the year 1500, marked a surge in commerce and innovation. This drove new methods of agriculture, building, communication, and technologies. Geoffrey Chaucer had already written about the sea trade routes in the 14th century, and the ports scattered from Scandinavia to Finisterre on the Atlantic coast and into the Mediterranean to Genoa and Venice. With the expansion of trade, industry, and science in the Middle Ages came improvement to ships that would facilitate larger cargoes and longer voyages, such as the structural ability to ship two masts instead of one, the development of the stern rudder in place of steering oars, stronger keels, and better anchors. In addition to structure, navigational instruments saw a surge in development and accuracy. It was Portugal's commercial activities in the 15th century that marked an epoch of distinct progress in practical navigation for Europeans. Expeditions were sent out by the Infante Enrique, or Henry the Navigator, that first led to the discovery of Porto Santo Island, near Madeira, in 1418, the rediscovery of the Azores in 1427, the discovery of Cape Verde Islands in 1447, and Sierra Leone in 1462, setting the scene for the seafarers of Europe to expand their territory and commerce in the coming centuries. Combined with the empirical observations gathered in oceanic seafaring, mapping, and the understanding of winds and currents, Portuguese explorers took the lead in the long-distance oceanic navigation, and by the beginning of the 16th century, a network of ocean routes covering the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Western Pacific Oceans lay open from the North Atlantic in South America to Asia. The Portuguese navigational activity is one of the earliest examples of systematic scientific observation, open to and taking into account confirmation of subsequent navigations. Successful navigation involves three main components, finding position, finding direction, and determining distance, the latter with the related factors of time and speed. We shall look at each of these in turn, and how they were used and developed during the Renaissance, the threshold of the age of exploration. Piloting involved reference to landmarks, soundings, currents, and using a lead line for sounding or depth. These were all valuable skills for ancient mariners, and remained so 
up until the present day, a valuable invention was the lead line in the 13th century, which was a tool for measuring the depth of water as well as the nature of the bottom. This line was weighted with lead at the end and had graduated markings in fathoms on the rope to determine sea depth. These were a series of colored rags and leather tags. The lead was coated with wax to bring up samples from the bottom. The hand lead is swung in a pendulum motion to produce momentum for two complete turns, then let go to allow the lead to sink ahead of the chains or the station on the ship from which soundings are taken. The leadsmen call out the depths referring to definite markings as by the mark and other depth values as by the deep and in fractions and a half and a quarter or a quarter less. For example, and a half five is five and a half fathoms or a quarter less four is three and three quarter fathoms. A hollow indentation in the end of the lead permits arming. Arming is the application of tallow or other sticky substance to the lead in order to sample the bottom. Whether it's sand or shale or pebble is all valuable information for the pilot. This method is still in use today with yachtsmen and sailors. A method of navigating from one depth to another based upon the condition of the bottom was also quite well developed with sailing directions in books from the 14th century in evidence. Taking position. Medieval mariners used the cross staff and the astrolabe to measure the angle above the horizon of the sun and stars to determine latitude. The cross staff was mentioned by Joao de Lisboa in his treatise on the nautical needle of 1514. Johannes Werner suggested the cross staff be used at sea in 1514 and improved measurements were introduced with better instruments for use in navigation. John Dee introduced it to England in the 1550s. In the original form of the cross staff, the pole or main staff was marked with graduations for length. The cross piece, also called the transom or transversal, slides up and down on the main staff. It was common to provide several transoms, each with a different range of angles it would measure. The user places one end of the main staff across their cheek, just below their eye. By sighting the horizon at the end of the lower part of the transom, then adjusting the cross arm on the main arm until the sun is at the other end of the transom. The altitude can then be determined by reading the position of the cross arm on the scale on the main staff. This value was converted to an angular measurement by looking up the value in a table. The cross staff was difficult to use. In order to get consistent results, the observer had to position the end of the pole precisely against his cheek. He had to observe the horizon and a star in two different directions, whilst not moving the instrument when he shifted his gaze from one to the other. In addition, observations of the sun required the navigator to look directly at the sun. This could be uncomfortable and made it difficult to obtain accurate altitude for the sun. Some mariners took to mounting smoked glass at the ends of the transoms to reduce the glare of the sun. As a navigational tool, the cross staff was eventually replaced, first by the back staff, or the quadrant, neither of which required the user to stare directly into the sun, and later by the octant and the sextant. The astrolabe was also used to determine angles to measure the altitude of a sun or a star, like Polaris, to determine a ship's latitude, 
or it could measure the angle between the top and bottom of an object to determine the distance to said object if its height were known, or the height of the object if its distance were known, or the horizontal angle between the two visible locations to determine one's point on a map. Heavy and clumsy, it was very difficult to use aboard a rolling ship. However, when new land was discovered and the astrolab taken ashore, the approximate latitude of the new discovery could be fixed. The mathematical background was established by Muslim astronomer Albentius in his treatise around 920 AD, which was translated into Latin by Plato Tiburtinus, De Motu Stellarum. The earliest surviving astrolab is dated between 927 and 928 AD. In the Islamic world, astrolabs were used to find the times of sunrise and the rising of fixed stars to help schedule morning prayers. In the 10th century, al-Sufi first described over 1,000 different uses of an astrolab in areas as diverse as astronomy, astrology, navigation, surveying, timekeeping, and prayer. The first known metal astrolab in Western Europe is the Datome Astrolab, made from brass in 11th century Portugal. Metal astrolabs avoided the warping that large wooden ones were prone to, allowing the construction of larger and therefore more accurate instruments. Metal astrolabs were heavier than wooden instruments of the same size, making it difficult to use them in navigation. In the 16th century, Johannes Stoeffler published Elucidadito Fabricie Urusque Astrolabi, a manual of the construction and use of the astrolab. The quadrant, meaning one-fourth, condensed the workings of the astrolab into an area one-quarter the size of the astrolab face. It was essentially a quarter of an astrolab. In the 13th century, Jewish astronomer Jakob ben Mahir ibn Tibbon was crucial in further developing the quadrant. He was a skilled astronomer and wrote several volumes on the topic, including an influential book detailing how to build and use an improved version of the quadrant. The quadrant that he invented came to be known as the Novus Quadrans, or New Quadrant. This device was revolutionary because it was the first quadrant to be built that did not involve several moving parts, and thus was smaller and more portable. His new quadrant was based upon the idea that the stereographic projection that defines a planispheric astrolab can still work if the astrolab parts are folded into a single quadrant. The result was a device that was far cheaper easier to use, and more portable than a standard astrolabe. Tibbon's work influenced Copernicus, Christopher Clavius, and Erasmus Reinhold, and his manuscript was referenced in Dante's Divine Comedy. The first documented use of the quadrant to navigate at sea is in 1461 by Diego Gomez. Sailors began by measuring the height of Polaris, to ascertain their latitude. It soon became common to take the height of the sun at a given time due to the fact that Polaris disappears south of the equator. In 1618, English mathematician Edmund Gunther further adapted the quadrant with an invention that came to be known as the Gunther Quadrant. This pocket-sized quadrant was inscribed with projections of the tropics, the equator, the horizon, and the ecliptic. With the correct tables, one could use the quadrant to find the time, the date, the length of the day or night, the time of sunrise and sunset, and the meridian. But the scales only applied to a certain latitude, so the instrument's use was limited at sea. For marine navigation, the earliest examples of a geometric quadrant with a plumb bob were found around 1460. They were not graduated in degrees but rather had the latitudes of most common destinations directly scribed on the limb. 
When in use, the navigator would sail north or south until the quadrant indicated he was at the destination's latitude. Turn in the direction of the destination and sail to the destination, maintaining a course of constant latitude. In order to measure the altitude of a star, the observer would view the star through the sights and hold the quadrant so that the plane of the instrument was vertical. The plumb bob was allowed to hang vertical and the line indicated the reading on the arc's graduations. It was not uncommon for a second person to take the reading while the first concentrated on observing and holding the instrument in proper position. The accuracy of the instrument was limited by its size and by the effect the wind or the observer's motion would have on the plumb bob. For navigators on the deck of a moving ship, these limitations could be difficult to overcome. Direction is the orientation of an imaginary line joining one point to another, measured in angular units, or degrees of an arc, aided by the compass, finding true north, and with a clock, degrees of longitude in minutes and seconds. The floating magnetic compass, or mariner's compass, was mainly used for determining wind direction. This could give a sailor valuable clues about his position and how to reach his destination based on previously recorded information and charts. The first accurate representation of the spherical Earth surface was the Mercator projection by Gerardus Mercator in 1569 of great value to navigators because a compass bearing could be shown as a straight line, but the problem of determining longitude delayed the use of these charts for some 70 years after they were introduced. It was not until 1701 that charts of magnetic variation in different parts of the world were available. Distance is the spatial separation between two points, or the length of a line on the surface of the Earth, in nautical miles. Throughout the history of navigation, latitude could be found relatively accurately. However, longitude could only be estimated at best. This was because the measurement of longitude is made by comparing the time of day difference between the mariner's starting location and his new location. Even some of the best clocks of the early 18th century could lose as much as 10 minutes per day, which translated into a computational error of 242 kilometers, or 150 miles or more. But the key to determining longitude, how far east or west they were located, lay in the invention of an accurate timekeeping device. It had long been known that the Earth was a globe and rotated one complete revolution in relation to the Sun every 24 hours, 360 degrees every day, 15 degrees every hour, 4 degrees every minute, measured degrees from starting point every noon. Navigators knew that the Sun reached its maximum altitude at noon, so no matter where on Earth, they were. This was considered so important that countries offered prizes for the invention of an accurate chronometer. The British prize was won by John Harrison in 1764 for his seagoing chronometer, accurate to one-tenth of a second per day. This invention was the most important advance to marine navigation in the three millennia that open ocean mariners had been going to sea. In 1884, by international agreement, the prime meridian, located at zero degrees longitude, was established as the meridian passing through Greenwich, England. Eight pocket sundials were found on the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's 
favorite warship. This example is 33 millimeters in diameter, featuring a brass gnomon that is collapsible, allowing a lid with a mirror inside to be placed on top and a sunken compass built in. A magnetized needle balanced on the brass pin and was covered with a brass lined panel of either mica or glass, allowing the owner to align it with the sun and giving an accurate reading. The chip log was invented and improved between 1500 and 1600. The chip log was a major advance that made dead reckoning much more accurate, allowing mariners to calculate the speed of a moving vessel. Using the sun and the stars, the navigator knew his beginning and ending latitude. Now he could determine the distance he had travelled to estimate his east-west position. A light line was knotted at regular intervals and waited to drag in the water. The end was tossed overboard over the stern as the pilot counted the knots that were let out during a specific period of time, measured usually by a sand glass in a gimbal. From this, the pilot could determine the speed at which the vessel was moving. Today, speed on the water is still measured in knots each one equaling one nautical mile per hour. The chip log was made of a wooden board attached to a log line. Holes were made at uniform spacing along the board bottom and have one end of the log lines tied to them. The log line is then wound around a reel. The shape of the wooden board is usually that of one quarter of a circle and there are holes made at each of the three edges. The lower side of the board is made of lead. When the speed of the vessel was to be measured, the sailor would throw the chip log into the sea towards the stern. The log line was then released in such a way that the wooded plank would stay at the same place in the water. The log line was allowed to run out of the reel for a specific amount of time and then stop. A sand glass was also used to measure the time taken by the ship to move away from the chip log. Markings as knots in the rope made on the log line, which represented the distance travelled by the ship, were counted. The main disadvantage of using chip log was that it neglected factors such as sea condition, speed and direction of currents, stretching of the line, and inaccuracy of measured time. In addition, two men were required to use the log, one to hold the reel, the other to throw the wooden piece, and possibly even another to time it. The main problem in navigating by sail alone lies in the change in the regime of winds and currents. The North Atlantic stream and the equatorial countercurrent flow south along the northwest coast of Africa, while the uncertain winds where the northeast trades meet the southeast trades, or the doldrums, can leave a sailing ship at the mercy of the currents. Together, prevalent current and wind make northwards progress very difficult or impossible. The Portuguese discovered the two large Volta do Mar, currents and trade winds of the north and of south Atlantic in the 15th century, that paved the way to reach the New World and return to Europe as well as to circumnavigate Africa in the western open sea in future voyages of discovery, avoiding contrary winds and currents. To resolve the difficulties involved in return trips, systematic exploration of the coasts and open sea conditions was undertaken, lasting until the final years of the 15th century. The repositories for the observations made were the Rotieros, or maritime route maps. The route taken by Vasco da Gama in 1497 was significantly different from the one taken by Pedro Avales Cabral in 1500, each being adapted to the season of departure. This adaptation shows an understanding of the cycle of yearly variations in winds and currents in the southern Atlantic. The most significant consequence of this systematized knowledge was negotiation of the Treaty of Tordesillas 
1494, moving the line of demarcation between Spanish and Portuguese interests 270 leagues to the west, from 100 to 370 leagues west of the Azores, with the consequence of affirming the Portuguese claim to Brazil and its dominance of the Atlantic. The impact of opening these routes to Europe cannot be understated. There were now direct routes to the east via the sea for trading in spices, silks, and luxury goods, and there was the discovery of gold in the Americas, exploited by the Spanish to the extent that piracy was albeit legalized at sea and rife between the powers of Europe. Peter Frankopan writes that a new world had been discovered overseas, but a new world was also being created at home, one where vibrant new ideas were encouraged, where new tastes were indulged, where intellectuals and scientists jostled and competed for patrons and funding, the rise in disposable incomes for those directly involved in the exploration of the continents, and the wealth they brought back funded a cultural transfusion that transformed Europe. A swathe of rich patrons emerged in a matter of decades, keen to spend on luxury. There was an increasing desire for the rare and the exotic. Europe's new wealth gave it swagger and confidence, and also reinforced faith in a way that the recapture of Jerusalem had been expected to do during the Crusades. To many, it was entirely obvious that the seemingly limitless fortune yielded from the Americas was an affirmation of God's blessings and had been ordained by the Lord on high who both gives and takes away kingdoms from whomever and in whatever way he wishes. The dawn of a new era, a veritable golden age, caused the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453 which had prompted wailing, breast-beating, and tears in the streets of Rome to be forgotten. The task was now to reinvent the past. The demise of the old imperial capital presented an unmistakable opportunity for the legacy of ancient Greece and Rome to be claimed by new adoptive heirs, something that was done with gusto. In truth, France, Germany, Austria, Spain, Portugal, and England had nothing to do with Athens and the world of the ancient Greeks, and were largely peripheral in the history of Rome, from its earliest days to its demise. This was glossed over as artists, writers, and architects went to work, borrowing themes, ideas, and texts from antiquity to provide a narrative that chose selectively from the past to create a story which over time became not only increasingly plausible, but standard. So, although scholars have long called this period the Renaissance, this was no rebirth. Rather, it was a nascence, a birth. For the first time in history, Europe lay at the heart of the world. Thank you for watching this video about ocean navigation in the Renaissance with me here in the study. If you enjoyed this, don't forget, please like and subscribe. Don't forget to check out the rest of the Renaissance ASMR project videos as they come out via the playlist, the details of which can be found below in the comments. Until then, I wish you a very relaxing and happy day or evening or night. Be good to yourself. Be kind to others and to the animals. And be extraordinary.